I, I'm going to call it the religion of justism. OK, so so there's like, the you know, there's this whole sequence of deflationary claims, right? Like each person who makes them thinks that they're like the first one. Right. And they, you know, there's like I've seen like like 500 different variants of this now. Right. Chat GPT, you know, it doesn't matter how impressive it looks because it is just a stochastic parrot. It is just a next token predictor. It is just a function approximator. It is just a gargantuan autocomplete. Right. And what these people never do, what it never occurs to them to do is to ask the next question. What are you just a right? (laughs) <laughs> right? Aren't you just the bundle of neurons and synapses? Right? I mean, like we could take that deflationary reductionistic stance about you also, right? Or, or if not, then we have to give some principle that separates the one from the other, right? You know, it is our burden to give that principle. So the way that someone was putting it on my blog was, okay, you know, they, they gave this giant litany, you know, look, GPT does not interpret sentences. It seems to interpret them. It does not learn. It seems to learn. It does not judge moral questions. It seems to judge moral questions. And so I just responded to this. I said, you know, that's great. And it won't change civilization. It will seem to change it. (laughs) So the person I was talking, his name is Scott Aronson. And he recently went to work for OpenAI as part of the AI alignment and safety. His previous work and research was into quantum computing. And so he started working for OpenAI in 2022 probably around the middle of the year. And by the end of the year, he put out a blog post titled Letter to His 11-Year-Old Self. In it, he says this, there's a company building an AI that fills giant rooms, eats a town's worth of electricity, and has recently gained an astounding ability to converse like people. It can write essays or poetry on any topic. It can ace college-level exams. It's daily gaining new capabilities that the engineers who tend to the AI can't even talk about in public yet. Those engineers do, however, sit in the company cafeteria and debate the meaning of what they're creating. What will it learn to do next week? Which jobs might it render obsolete? Should they slow down or stop so as not to tickle the tail of the dragon? But wouldn't that mean someone else, probably someone with less scruples, would wake the dragon first? Is there an ethical obligation to tell the world more about this? Is there an obligation to tell it less? And he's saying that his job at the company is to develop a mathematical theory of how to prevent the AI and its successors from wreaking havoc. So that's Erison right there in 2011. This is from this paper that was leaked. Uh, and my take is, I, I think this is BS. After reading it and trying to verify some of it, I mean, it's, I just don't buy it. Here's the thing. It starts out really good. It had me going, but at some point it kind of rapidly falls apart and it's trying to push this idea that GPT-4 or some other model that they built in 2022 has 100 trillion parameters. Now, again, I I don't buy it. I'll post it down below if you guys want to take a look at it. But anyways, my take is is a lot of this is, is nonsense. But in this PDF, there are three interesting links to papers or things that other very credible researchers have wrote. And specifically, this guy talking about AI is also really interesting. So in this video, let's briefly look at scaling laws and when we can expect digital neural nets to exceed kind of the complexity of the human brain. And basically the definition of AGI that the author kind of states is, it can do any intellectual task that a smart human can. 2020 was the first time I was shocked by an AI system. That was GPT-3. So the world was catching up to something that these people were interacting with years before. So people were surprised by its ability to reason, even as early as GPT-3, which GPT-3, I feel like most people haven't even interacted with this because Chad GPT, the big thing that most people got their hands on, that was GPT-3.5, kind of an updated version. And he's saying that somewhere in there, there was this massive leap because before that, chatbots had no ability to respond coherently at all. Why was GPT-3 such a massive leap? And so here we're getting into parameter count. So really fast, exactly what is a parameter? So in neural networks, we're kind of replicating the human brain. So here's kind of a diagram of a neural network. These little round things, they're called neurons, which is the digital version of the neuron that's in our brain. Basically, these neurons connect to each other and pass information back and forth. So let's say there's a neuron in your brain that's responsible for food. I'm simplifying, obviously, but let's say there's another one that's 
it's the smell of cooking. So when you when you smell something delicious cooking on the stove, that triggers this neuron. Now, obviously, the actual brain is much more complicated. There's a whole, it's not like one neuron does this or that, but just for illustrative purposes, like let's say this neuron is food and this neuron is smell of cooking. Each time you smell something cooking and then you get food, the connection between these two neurons gets a little bit stronger. Over time, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger until the smell of cooking gets to be kind of a predictive thing for you getting food. Whenever you smell cooking, you know that there's food around. You're going to get food. This is kind of how your brain is able to predict the future, if you will. And this is how brains work in humans. And also in dogs, if a dog smells something cooking or the smell of food, whatever smells trigger food for them, you know, it might start salivating because it knows food is coming. So one day this handsome fella decided to decided to see if he can trick these dogs into creating other neural connections that aren't triggered by smells, but instead by something kind of random, like ringing a bell. So this is Ivan Pavlov. Uh, if you've ever heard that term, Pavlovian response, that's kind of his doing. He would ring a bell every time before he served dogs food. So he'd ring a bell and give them some food. And this would go over a course of however long. Ring a bell, give them food. Ring a bell, give the dog food. It was a whole thing. They really went all in on this. Now, obviously, beforehand, if you just rang a bell, the dog didn't really have any response to it. It didn't mean anything to the dog. But after doing this for a time, the dog started salivating after hearing a bell. The dogs were conditioned to salivate and expect food whenever that bell rang. By the way, this is why The Office was such a great show, because that whole prank that Jim plays on Dwight with the breath mints was literally him conditioning that Pavlovian response by giving him a breath mint every time there was a the Microsoft Office ding or whatever. But the point here is with the dogs and Dwight, I guess, as this this thing kept happening where a bell would ring and then he and the dog would get a treat, the actual like physical wiring in the brain, these neural connections would get stronger and stronger. So the bell became a stronger and stronger signal for, you know, there's food coming until the dog was like, okay, anytime I hear a bell, that means I get food. Like it was convinced of that. So in the neural nets, in the AI, weights and biases, they determine kind of the strength of that connection, how often those connections get called, how strong they are. So for example, before the Pavlovian conditioning of the dog, you know, a bell ringing might have a very low connection to, you know, getting food. The dog doesn't connect a bell to getting food. But as he keeps hearing, you know, bing, food, bing, food, th this connection gets stronger to where there's a stronger, there's a stronger predictive ability between the bing and the food, between the bell and the food. And all these various connections are referred to as parameters. And so the more parameters, the more connections, the more possible, I guess, predictive abilities. And so when we refer to the the size of the AI model, the size of the LLM, we refer to it as the number of parameters, the number of total connections. And then when we train the model, when we give it data, you can think of all these as little knobs and dials that we kind of twist and turn to try to create con these connections that make sense. Then we, then we have our input and the output, and we try to understand like how good is this brain, this series of connections, weights and biases, how good is it at producing the response? If it's way off, then we have a process called backpropagation where we go back and kind of like flip these dials into different positions and we try again. And these back and forward passes over time set all the little dials and knobs into the correct position to get the outputs that we're looking for. So I kind of think of this as that game where you say if you're getting hotter or colder, right? So you move in a certain direction, that's the forward pass. And then the person you're playing with goes, you're getting warmer. And so you do the back propagation. So that's where, you know, maybe you turn in a slightly different direction and you head in that direction, right? And then the person goes, oh, you're almost there. You're getting hot, right? So basically the hotter you get, the less changes you make to what you're doing. If they're saying, oh, you're ice cold, then you make a lot of changes and you flip all these dials in, in different directions. I mean, slightly more complicated than that, but I feel like what I've described is a pretty good analogy. And so the paper continues deep learning is a concept that essentially goes back to the beginning of AI research in the 1950s. The first neural network was created in the 50s and modern neural networks are just deeper, meaning they contain more layers. These are the layers. So there's just more, more layers across the network. 
And most of the major techniques in AI today are rooted in the basic 1950s research combined with a few minor engineering solutions like back propagation and transformer models. Yeah, it's not, it's just a few minor tweaks. I think most people would say that these are kind of, I mean, big deals, but his point is a lot of this, the idea of neural networks isn't exactly new. So he's saying there's only two reasons for the recent explosion of AI capabilities, size and data. Uh, so maybe a different way of saying that is just, we can have massive progress, massive improvements with, with just improving the size and the data. Like this alone will create massive progress without necessarily other breakthroughs. I think that's fair to say. And a growing number of people in the field are beginning to believe we've had the technical details of AGI solved for many decades. We just didn't have the computing power, we didn't have the data, and we didn't have the internet for all the data. So this is John Carmack. So he was the guy that created the original Doom, him and John Romero. And so he's, he's kind of a big deal. Like he's well-known, highly respected. Here's him with Elon Musk. Here's him with Notch. So that's the creator of Minecraft who sold it for billions, I think, to Microsoft. I think he like single-handedly coded Minecraft way back in the day. Here's him on stage with Steve Jobs. I think he worked for Meta on the whole virtual reality for, for quite some time. And on the Lex Friedman podcast, he talked about kind of this very idea. And he actually founded recently announced that he started his own AGI lab. And he's saying like for the first time in kind of humor history, just one or a handful of people can have like an incredible result on the world, this leverage by creating AGI. And he kind of said something similar that we probably have the technical details of AGI. Like we, we've had it solved. And I believe he also said that if you had to write, write out like all the things that you needed to know to solve AGI, it would probably fit on a napkin. Like there might be 10 things that we kind of needed to solve that would allow for AGI to happen. And a lot of them are probably hidden away in various texts and textbooks over the past, you know, power many decades. So this idea that it's probably not going to come from some brand new thing that no one has expected but rather from something that has been already talked about, right? Like just like neural nets, you know, the first one was created in the fifties, right? So it's been around for a while. And so they're saying, what is this parameter? Well, it's kind of like a synapse, 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 however you pronounce that. So it's like a synapse in a biological brain connection between neurons and each neuron in the biological brain has roughly a thousand connections to other neurons. And of course, digital neural networks are analogous to biological brains. So this is interesting. How many parameters, right? Synapses or parameters are in a human brain. So the figure that is commonly cited is 100 trillion. So keep that number in mind, 100 trillion, 100 trillion parameters in the human brain. So with AGI, we're trying to achieve something similar to a human brain or the human brain's capabilities, the general intelligence. So in nature, that's a hundred quote unquote parameters. So Yale neuroscience, a hundred trillion synaptic connections, human brain. There are more neurons in a single brain than there are stars in the Milky Way. And a cat has 250 billion synapses. A dog has 530 billion synapses. Synapse count generally seems to predict higher intelligence. This guy is now just talking crap about cats. I'm not sure how I feel about that. And he knows that, yeah, there's, there's some exceptions. For example, elephants have higher count than humans, yet display lower intelligence. And he kind of explains that, that the quality of data might answer for those uh, exceptions. So human brains evolved from higher quality socialization and communication data than elephants. But the point is synapse count is definitely important. And so GPT-2, the synapse count is less than a mouse's brain. GPT-3 is approaching a cat's brain. So it's intuitively obvious that an AI system the size of a cat's brain would be superior to an AI system the size of a mouse's brain. So all other things equal, certainly that's the case. Predicting AI performance. In 2020, after the release of the 175 billion parameter GPT-3, many speculate about the potential performance of a model that is 600 times larger. So that's the 100 trillion parameters, kind of where it's equivalent to the human brain. So GPT-3 is like 0.175%. So it's like a 10th of 1% of what the human brain is in terms of parameters. So is it possible to predict AI performance by parameter count? And as it turns out, the answer is yes. And so here's the paper. It's saying there are roughly two 
2 times 10 to the 14th power synapses in the human brain, which that's that's 200 trillion. So it's double than that Yale quoted earlier, Yale neuroscience. So th here they're saying 200, you know, double what, double that amount, right? And this line here looks like it's this line on the chart. That's where the parameters equal synapses in the brain. So this is kind of where that line, when we cross it over, that's when neural networks match the parameters in of the human brain, according to this article. And the dark green line, that's the next level line here. So again, so this is where it matches the human brain. This is the TAI, the transformative model. So this is Ajaya Kotra. And so in this little speech she gave, the introducer said Ajaya. So I'm just going to go with that Ajaya. So this is Ajaya. And this is from lesswrong.com. I'll post this in the show notes. We probably, it's a little bit older at this point, August 2022, but we might look into it. But she talks about TAI, which is, I mean, you can think of it as AGI. So basically kind of a similar idea. So like at what point is it going to get to the point of maybe replacing human workers uh, or, or at least being as capable as human workers. But, but this kind of jumped out at me. So she was saying, when writing my report, I was imagining that a transformative model would likely need to be able to do almost all the tasks that remote human workers can do. And again, we might do a deep dive into this article, but I got to say, in my mind, I think this is a much better sort of conceptual way of thinking about AGI. Like at what point can it do anything that a remote human worker can do? So basically, if you have a job where a person doesn't need to come into the office and you communicate through emails and they do whatever whatever it is that they do, whether that's Excel or writing or coding, design, whatever, like when will TAI or AGI, when can AI kind of just do all of that? Or in other words, if you're a remote worker, and currently you spend half of the time that you're supposed to be working playing Helldivers 2, at what point can you spend all of your time playing Helldivers 2? But the point is this green line, that's the median, that's the average estimate for the number of parameters in that transformative model, that TAI. And the 80% confidence interval, so kind of is between these two number of parameters. So meaning at what point are we fairly certain that we've achieved that? At how many parameters have we achieved AGI? Well, it's as low as GPT-3 and uh, and as high as, so t 10 to the 18th, that's one quintillion. So if I'm doing my math right, so that's 10,000 times more than what the human brain would be. So this extrapolation shows that AI performance will reach human level abilities as it reaches human level size parameter count. So what we just went over, I don't know how much of it I believe. I went through it. I ended up cutting most of it. But this Scott Aronson guy really jumped out to me. Here's a paper that he did, The Computational Complexity of Linear Optics, talking about giving new evidence that quantum computers cannot be efficiently simulated by classical computers. It's interesting that a quantum computer guy is working at OpenAI's, you know, AI safety and alignment. There's some more interesting stuff ahead. I apologize if today's video is a little bit disjointed, but this whole thing is getting uh, a lot more interesting. More to come very soon.